to talk to you a little bit about some work I've been doing um, on a, uh, a, a project. This has been this is kind of a long, a long-term uh, passion project of mine, uh, looking at the settlement of uh, the Pacific and, in particular, trade and interaction after the initial settlement. Um, and I've just uh, come from the uh, the worst of all conference scares, where two minutes before you're about to present. PowerPoint crashes and says it's gone corrupt. Uh, but luckily, it looks like we've been resolved, but if, you know, we've got some, uh, some, some wonky images, I apologize. Um, so this is work I've been doing in collaboration with Dr. Melinda Allen and Andrew McAllister at the University of Auckland. Um, and they've been working for quite some time looking at um, patterning in the uh, exchange of lithic artifacts within the Polynesian Islands. Um, and um, I've been asked as part of a, 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 a kind of a larger project to try and simulate some of these processes and better understand what the patterning in the lithic distributions means. And that's, I think, um, we got. Yeah. All right, fine. Um, and that's really kind of the heart of, of my research. Um, it's really the research question that drives pretty much every project that I, that I begin is what, um, what's behind the patterning in the archaeological record. Um, and I think this, um, this has come up to some extent during the discussions that we've had over the last couple of days. Um, issues concerning validation of models. How can we tell whether what our model is, is real? How can we tell if what our, our model is doing can model human systems? These are all kinds of the types of philosophical questions that modelers grapple with all the time. Um, to me, um, and this is, you know, I, this could be um, my own background. This could be, you know, my, the, you know, my own interests. It could be that I'm, I'm, I'm just too simple to try and model much, much more complicated social systems. But to me, the, the, um, this, this, uh, process of modeling um, melds almost naturally with the uh, literature and the history of archaeological inquiry that focuses on the formation of the record. Um, we think of the record as something that accumulates over time as the result of depositional processes that are absolutely tied to complex social systems but eventually result in the more mundane deposition and eventual uh, <coughs> recovery of the, the, the objects in question. And so this is what I'm going to be focusing on in my talk, is how do we get at what drives patterning in the archaeological record? And I'm probably going to be taking a page from Andrew Kostopoulos um, in this talk um, in thinking about um, things like the sand pile problem and thinking about um, how we can start to look at complex processes and complex patterning through very simple processes. Um, and here we'll be looking at the distribution of lithics. But first, just a little background, um, possibly a map that you have not yet seen uh, during, this, uh, during the course of this conference. Uh, this is the Pacific Ocean and many, but not nearly all of the islands. Um, that we find in the Pacific. Uh, just to, to orient you here, we have to the north uh, from the Marianas Islands east, we have Micronesia. From Papua New Guinea up to about Fiji, we have Melanesia. And then the islands situated in the triangle between New Zealand, Hawaii, and Rapa Nui Easter Island are the islands of Polynesia. Okay. Um, the settlement of Polynesia is kind of a, um, it, it's, it's got, it kind of operates in two acts. It's a, it's a play with two acts. Um, the first is the initial migration of people into the uh, Western Pacific Islands. Starting about 40,000 years ago, people um, start to migrate um, in, as part of the migration, you know, 60,000 years ago, we get people in Papua New Guinea, possibly earlier, but then shortly after, they begin to make short island hops out to the end of the Solomon Islands chain, and we get people to the Solomons by about 39,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago. Um, and then the migration eastward kind of slows. There's not a lot of, as far as we can tell, there's not a lot of progress. 
Um, but about, starting at about 35,000 years ago, we get new migrants coming into the area, speaking Austronesian languages, carrying with them distinctive um, artifact types, including Lapita-type pottery, um, and they begin making their way through this area and then rapidly disperse out into the islands of Eastern Melanesia and Western Polynesia, uh, making it as far as Tonga and Samoa. In Tonga and Samoa, there's a pause, and we believe during that period of time, we get the transition from the Lapita cultural complex into what we would now call ancestral Polynesian, um, which uh, includes, which, which involves, um, from a material culture standpoint, the loss of pottery, um, uh, the development of uh, fine ground, uh, fine uh, stone ground, fine grained uh, basalt axes, um, the use of uh, the tapa cloth. Um, and a few other cultural components. Um, there's a secondary migration wave that takes place to the north and settles Micronesia during this period of time. And eventually, we're not quite sure whether um, uh, this meets up somewhere in East Polynesia, possibly Samoa. This is something that gets debated quite a bit. Um, within the last 1,000, 1,200, 1,300 years, um, we get a um, migration um, eastward um, from Tonga Samoa, making their way eventually to, sorry, I should be using this pointer. This, I know the islands are kind of hard to see on this map. Um, making their way eastward to what we call Central East Polynesia, that's Tahiti, the Society Islands, the Cook Islands, the Marquesas. Um, and then from there, they migrate out and settle the margins of the Polynesian Triangle. Okay. It's a pretty fascinating story. Uh, the, the ancestral Polynesian people have been traveling uh, these expansive nautical distances to settle pretty much every, every inhabitable landmass uh, in the Pacific using a Neolithic technology. Um, we have, but we have pretty good evidence for that migration process. We have genetic evidence pointing to the ancestor descendant relationships between peoples and the island groups. We have linguistic evidence that can connect the islands back to Southeast Asia. We have um, all kinds of archaeological evidence, shared uh, material cultural uh, uh, objects. Um, but one thing that has been less studied has been after the migration process, what happens? Is there sustained interaction between the island groups, which are spread at quite some, in some cases at quite long distances? One of the things that's been looked at pretty extensively in this uh, to answer this question has been geochemical sourcing of lithic artifacts. Um, we find that in excavations all around Polynesia, we find evidence for basalt artifacts, particularly adzes, being exchanged over quite long distances. In some cases, we get um, up here in the Marquesas Islands to down here in the Society Islands, which is uh, over 2,000 kilometers distance. Um, traveled overseas. Um, in some cases, in many cases, we find this uh, stone from Samoa here transferred out to the Cook Islands, the Austral Islands, and so forth. And again, we find this type of these types of interaction spheres occurring all over, even in places that got disconnected from the rest of Polynesia. So in New Zealand, for example, we get a, a, a migration, a, a, an exploration radius around where people bring obsidian from Mayor Island here in the Bay of Plenty out to the Kermadec Islands, Norfolk Island, and even south into the Subantarctic Islands. These exotic lithics, artifacts that come from another island and are found um, in, in assemblages, usually in, in combination with other artifacts from, from, localis, from local sources, um, are explained in different ways, but usually it, it's, it's done with recourse to some kind of a social explanation, some kind of social mechanism that's maintaining these, these interactions. Um, so things like um, talking about the, the cost of voyaging and how that must have been supported um, by um, a, you know, an, an elite that was capable of sending out these voyages of interaction. Um, we talk about in Tonga, for example, we find lots of Samoan lithics in Tonga, and people argue for political centralization in Tonga and craft specialization in Samoa and an exchange relationship that extends to there. But the point being that there's lots of social explanations that get invoked for these lithic distributions. 
And this is the kind of, this is the heart of the question that I want to ask is what can be inferred from these patterns of lithic distribution? So we find these exotic lithics, these pieces that come from far away. Does this mean that there was direct interaction between these places? Do the relative abundances of exotic lithics, does that indicate the strength of a relationship? And how much of the pattern that we see is intentional in the sense of it needs to be explained by some sort of preferential relationship between two groups, or how much of it is strictly the geography of the Pacific Islands? And this last question is really what I'm going to try and look at specifically with a model. So this is my first foray into the network modeling process. So for those of you who are network modelers, I welcome your questions, and I hope, I hope that you can find some of the holes in this process that I'm, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. I begin with islands as nodes, and, each, and the islands have a characteristic of the type of lithology there is. There are volcanic high islands that have basalt, and there are limestone islands that have no basalt. Um, we set a cutoff for a uh, threshold for island size at about uh, 25 um, hectares, um, dependent on whether there was any other um, islands in the neighborhood. And the reason for doing this is, is that it, what we end up with is kind of a swamped signal. Um, if we are including little islets that are just offshore, we kind of contribute, we kind of um, amass those into their, their, their close by. They had to be within at least, I think, a, a five kilometer radius. These are really just offshore islets that got excluded. Um, so we've got our islands, and then we connect the islands based on a maximum sailing distance. And what we're saying here is that this is the maximum distance that um, individuals could sail comfortably um, between different island groups. And so there is, of course, the inbuilt assumption here. And what we get is we get, uh, when we reduce the sailing distance, we get the network becomes less and less connected until eventually you reach a certain point at which parts of the network become disconnected. Um, the assumption here, if we go back up and look at 800 kilometers here, the assumption here, though, is that there is no difference based on distance within that threshold. So it's just as easy to sail in this model 100 kilometers as it is to sail 800 kilometers. All right? and we realize that's an assumption. We're trying to simplify this process and just say, this is the limit that people can sail to. But of course, it is a model, and so some assumptions need to be considered. We begin, we put our agents onto the network and let them move around the islands. And this model is effectively a random walk where the <coughs> The, uh, the boat will begin at an island, and they'll pick up some stone. Right? So they start with a kit size of about 10, and then they begin to move from island to island. Okay? So they picked up stone, and they move from island to island. When they reach another island, they deposit some stone on that island. And the, the choice of island that they go to is random. They'll pick any island that is connected within the maximum sailing radius. And they move from one island to the next, and then they'll drop off some stone, okay? And that becomes part of the local assemblage. And then they move on, and do the same thing. They'll drop off a piece of stone, and we're starting to lose stone from our kit. And then eventually, they'll reach another island that has stone. And while they will contribute something from their own kit, they'll also replenish. And get their hit back up to 10 and start the process again. Okay? Now, this is not realistic at all because we know that these people had cultures and had homes and went home to those homes. Right? But we're, what we're doing is looking at how a, dis, a random distribution process operates on these networks. Right? We want to see how, a pro, because we're interested in how much influence the geography has versus any kind of preference that the agents might have, okay? A couple of just additional assumptions in this model. Behaviors contributing to exotic lithic assemblages we're considering to be different from those contributing to the local origin, right? We're assuming that people aren't gonna go sail out 500 kilometers when they need a sharp piece of stone, right? So we're not including local artifacts in this analysis. We're only interested in exotic lithics. 
and that's anything that comes from another island. Additionally, lithic assemblages are treated as a single accumulations, right? And so we're thinking of these in terms of palimpsests. We're not separating them out by time, and that's because this is a very abstract model, and I'm not interested in change over time. If we wanted to use this model to understand change through time, we would have to use different configurations of the model to account for different layers within an, an, uh, an excavation, okay? But right now, we're not considering time explicitly. Okay, so in this model, we've got the Pacific Islands. The red islands here are um, volcanic islands. The gray islands are coral atolls or limestone islands and that don't have basalt. Um, and so we start with a maximum sailing radius of zero. Can't go anywhere. Nothing moves. We bump it up to 250 kilometers. That connects parts of the, uh, the network here. So we get the Tuamotus being connected to the Society Islands. The Southern Cooks are kind of their own unit. Same goes for the Austral Islands, Tonga, Samoa. Everything's kind of separate, though. Once we get up to 500 kilometers, then we're getting a lot more connection. But we've still got this pretty distinct separation between um, the uh, islands of the Western Pacific and East Polynesia. Um, and there's a cultural and temporal divide there as well, um, but we're not really considering those in the model. So, this, but this is this is an interesting model. Just this is an interesting network, just in that regard. Bump things up to 750, and now pretty much, thank you, everything's connected except for poor old Rapa Nui Easter Island way over here. Um, we keep bumping things up to a thousand, more and more connections. We get to 2,000, and eventually we finally connect. Rapa Nui or Easter Island, and then one, we, have, we can keep going and keep going and keep going up to 9,000 kilometers before we get a completely connected network. So I'm interested in exploring the space between not connected at all and completely connected so that geography is not even a consideration, right? Okay. So one of, a couple of things we find um, when we look at this model, we get kind of, this is, these plots here are looking at, this is uh, the uh, what is this, the max distance, uh, the maximum uh, distance source in the assemblage. So if you're on Fiji and the furthest thing away was from Samoa, then that's where the distance would be, would be the distance to Samoa. Um, and this is moving out across those different sailing radii in the network, right? So network of 500, network of 1,000, and so on. And we see, and as you would expect, an increase in the um, maximum distance, but eventually a plateau. Um, but changes also in the variability, so this is just the top, the max and minimum, um, changes in the variability across um, as the network size increases. And this is different for different places in the Pacific, so the geography is having an influence on this distribution um, in these different places. So we've got the Marquesas, Tahiti, and Tonga in this map. Very quickly, I'm just going to talk about a case study where we're looking at the island of Aichutaki, where we actually have an assemblage we can compare. Aichutaki is in the southern Cook Islands, about uh, 1,500 kilometers from um, Mangaya. And the south, this is the Cook Islands. Or you've got, you, they're, it's spread out over an area about 1,500 by 1,500 kilometers um, area of the Pacific. Archaeological research has primarily been constricted to the southern islands. Aichutaki is one of those. Thank you. Um, We've been doing archaeological survey and uh, excavation there. Melinda Allen began in 1996 at Motu in Aitutaki, uh, followed up by excavations more recently, which included a survey of heirloom artifacts. I'm only considering the original excavations at Motu in this study, and we're looking at the geochemical signatures to get a sense of how far away they come from. Um, and so we're just going to go through the radius here, the different radii beginning at 250 kilometers. We don't get a, the red dots are the empirically observed distances that we get from the sources and their frequency uh, as a percentage of all the uh, exotic lithics. Not a great match at 250, much better at 500. And then we're starting to overshoot quite a bit when we get to 750, 1,000. And then at 2,000, it just doesn't look anything like it. But, and then same thing, oh yeah. So here's our map. Again, the orange islands, the, the yellow island is Aichutaki. Orange islands are islands where we get the, um, in the simulation, the islands that we get um, stones from. And here's what it looks like at 500. 
and then we look at 750. The interesting thing here is that at 500, we don't get Samoa in the mix, and we know we get Samoan lithics in our assemblages at Aichutaki. So this is not a good model, this 500 model, but we remember at 500, West Polynesia is not connected. And at 750 it is, but we're overshooting. So we look at 550, look at that, Samoa is in the mix. So we get Samoa in the mix, it's still a reasonably good fit. It fits within, within what we would expect. This is suggesting that the geography, that limited geography, of, if we limit the, the sailing radius to 550, that can explain the observable patterning at least at Aitutaki. Okay, so what are we talking about? I know I'm down to my last minute here. Thank you. Um, we get a reasonably good match at around 550. Does this mean that that was the maximum sailing radius for Polynesian voyagers? Does that mean we've solved the question of exchange and interaction in the Pacific? Only if it were that simple. Uh, no, of course we haven't. Of course we haven't. That's not, that's not what we're saying. A match between the model and the pattern means we do not need a more complicated explanation for the given data set. Right? That means that this data set can be explained in this, using this very simple model. We don't have to um, extend the explanation to include social mechanisms, preferential um, attachment within the networks. Um, because we find similarities between the observed assemblages and the geographically mediated one network, that this means we do not need to... Oh, right? This gives us an idea of where to look next, how we can test this model. We can go out, we can find new assemblages, we can go out and try and test this data using this network model. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of great published case studies on this issue, so it's hard to test. But we know now what we need to do that. Um, and that doesn't mean, the important thing I think to take away is that a simple explanation from a model doesn't mean the society in question was simple. They weren't necessarily like this simulation. In fact, they could be quite different, right, in terms of their voyaging strategies, but we don't need it to explain this pattern. And that doesn't mean that there weren't many complex social processes going on in the Pacific. I'm sure there were but we don't need them to explain the distribution of lithics that we find on Aitutaki. That's what I got for today. Dankeschön.